In today's video, I'm going to talk to you about what happens in court after your shoplifting charge. My name is Adam Rawson. I'm the owner of the Rawson Law Firm. We're criminal and white collar defense lawyers in South Florida. I'm a former prosecutor and me and my team, we've handled hundreds if not probably thousands of these type of cases and we help good people when bad things happen so they can achieve their best future. And by the end of this video, we want you to know all that there is to know about what happens in court and the court process for a shoplifting charge in Florida. So let's talk about what happens in court on a shoplifting charge in Florida. So really, it's gonna be the normal process for any misdemeanor or felony in Florida. So, and the way that works is your first court date's going to be usually an arraignment. What an arraignment is, is that's the date when the prosecutors read the formal, the formal charges that have been filed against you. Um, and you have an opportunity to say either guilty, not guilty, or no contest, right? And so our clients never plead guilty or no contest at an arraignment date. We always plea them not guilty. And what that means is we actually get to defend the case because if you are, if you go in and you plead guilty, well then the case is over and it's done. And now you've admitted guilt and even on no contest, you know, you're, it's the same thing basically. Case is over, you're guilty, there's no defense. So we always plea everybody, plea every one of our clients not guilty. Um, those formal charges are read to you along with the minimum and maximum penalties. So remember for some of the misdemeanor shoplifting, it could be 60 days in jail or a year in jail and usually the shoplifting felony would be up to five years in prison. So they're gonna tell you what those minimum and maximum penalties are. What we do is we waive arraignment by, by our kind of internal procedures and rules. Um, we're allowed to waive arraignment according to the Florida Rules of Criminal Procedure. And why should a client have to drive down to the courthouse, pay for parking, take off of work, and really stand there and wait you know, for maybe an hour in court with all the time spent getting to court to go up in front of a judge for 20 seconds and say, not guilty, when's my next court date, right? So we try to waive that and even cancel that arraignment date because quite frankly, we don't wanna be there either for that. Um, and most of the judges in court houses um, and counties will allow us to just very quickly waive an arraignment. Your second court date is usually called a pretrial conference. It could be called a case disposition, um, it could be called a sounding, a status conference, or a calendar call. Um, different judges in different jurisdictions use some different language, but they're all the same thing. It's more or less, it's a status. Now, your, the, um, the client's appearance is mandatory, unless it's waived by the attorney. Now, there's a very specific process that you need to do in order to waive a client's appearance. And basically all it is is you need to get it in writing and signed by the client and you, know, and you need to file that paperwork. That's something that we do on all of our cases for all of our clients as well. And why do we do it? Well, the reason that we do it is we don't want our clients to feel beaten and broken down by the system. We don't want them to have to show up six or 10 or 15 times to court. Court cases are often slow and slower is usually better for our clients. So we want to shield them from having every three, four, five, six weeks to show up and show up and take off work and have them cost money and feel that pressure of, you know, kind of being grinded down by the system. So we waive our clients for these statuses. Um, clients can always show up, but they don't have to. Um, and that's, that's really helpful. You know, um, and also we can kind of get in and get out into, you know, these court appearances a lot faster without having to worry if a client's going to be late or anything. Um, again, clients can always show up, but it, you know, when they do, they'll go, oh, this is all it was. Yeah, I don't want to deal with this anymore. And that's no problem. You know, we encourage that. We have clients who are out on out of custody on shoplifting cases all the way to murder cases that don't have to show up. So if you're not going to have to show up for a murder case, well, you shouldn't have to show up for a shoplifting case either. So then you'll have this, you know, the status date that we talked about. And really, you know, at this first status date, it's just a kind of a quick, hey judge, here's what's going on. You know, um, judge is gonna wanna hear from the prosecutor, judge is gonna wanna hear from us, right? And it's usually, again, a quick court appearance, um, especially if it's the first or second one. But by that first status, we should have the discovery from the prosecutors. And if we don't have the discovery, well then what we're gonna do 
is we're going to file a motion to compel, right? And we're going to ask the judge to compel the prosecutor to get us that discovery, usually within five or 15 days. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, judge, we want this delay or this continuance or this reset um, charged to the state. We want them to be held accountable because they got us the paperwork that we needed um, late. And that could be a very good strategic, um, you know, strategic advantage to us in these cases. And in that particular case, we would not waive speedy trial. So let me talk about, a little bit about what speedy trial is. So in the state of Florida, um, the prosecutors have the burden to bring our clients to trial on a misdemeanor case within 90 days after the date of their arrest or on a felony case within 175 days upon um, after the date of their arrest. And most of the time, I'd say 90% of the time, we will waive speedy trial because we need more time to do more work, more defense work on our cases. But sometimes we'll have a strategic advantage where we really want to get this case moving along fast. And if the prosecutors are late with their paperwork, well, then we would not waive speedy trial. We would have them be penalized and we would continue to put the pressure on them with that speedy trial. These are things that prosecutors and judges never want to have a case dismissed due to speedy trial. So it's, it could be a really good strategy and tactic for us, usually at this very first status date, especially if they're late and behind on, on their discovery obligations. Regardless, um, you know, at that court date, we'll usually have it reset, right? Whether it's charged to us or charged to the prosecutors, and we'll come back in another four to six weeks, and then we'll, ha we'll have a bunch of those. Um, you know, and like I said, some of these cases can be three to six months. Some of these cases can be six to 12 or even, you know, nine to, you know, 18 months or, or one to two years, depending on the complexity and severity of the case. Usually shoplifting cases are, you know, in that more three to nine month range or so. They're, they don't go on for that long, but we'll have a few of these statuses really just to keep the judge informed about what the prosecutors are up to, what we're up to, our plea negotiations going well, our depositions being taken, so on and so forth. Now, for us, what we like to do is if we cannot negotiate a favorable resolution, which most of the time is a dismissal or a reduction of charges, then we're gonna wanna take depositions. So on misdemeanor cases, we have to ask the judge's permission, and on felony cases, we can just take our depositions. And what a deposition is, is we're gonna subpoena the officers and the witnesses. So in a shoplifting case, it'll be the civilian LPO, loss prevention officer. It'll be the police officer that either arrested my client or wrote the notice to appear. And if there's any other witnesses at all. And what we'll do is we'll send them a subpoena. We'll either have them come to our office. Nowadays, we may do it over Zoom. And we're gonna, gr we're gonna grill them, we're gonna question them. We're gonna review all the reports and the full discovery beforehand. And we're gonna have our court reporter there, basically typing everything out. And um, it's gonna be a written record, and it's gonna be under oath. And we've had you know, cases that looked unwinnable, that we've been able to win because of these depositions. Depositions and legal motions are our two biggest tools to get cases dismissed or to quote unquote, win a case, get a great result without having to go to trial. And a lot of times, also, those depositions will help set us up for a win at trial or a win at a motion later. So depositions are crucial, and we grill them on anything and everything that we can about the case. And like I said, a lot of times, there's gold, absolute gold in these depositions. So it's very important for your lawyer to take depositions on your case. So now let's talk about motions. Right, And so motions are where I really say we go from criminal defense to criminal offense, right? Like kind of those sports analogies. Um, good things happen when you file motions. I'll say it again, good things, if not great things happen when you file motions. Uh, motions to suppress, motions that involve a constitutional violation of your client's rights. And what I tell people is most of the time our clients don't even know their rights were violated. Earlier I talked about Miranda, um, that's one example, but there's a lot of different type of motions that we can talk about. Um, there's motions to suppress evidence, there's motions to suppress statements such as Miranda, um, physical evidence. Um, there's a lot of different type of motions that we can file on these cases. And so when we file them, the prosecutors are, have now the burden to defend against our allegations of police misconduct. 
And so again, that's how we go from offense to defense. Now they have to defend against this. We've had many cases, many shoplifting cases and all types of criminal cases where we've had reduced charges because we filed the motion. We've had a better case for trial because we filed the motion or we've gotten a flat out dismissal, um, either prior to the motion or based on arguing the motion and the judge agreed with us and dismissed either, either a part of the case or the entire case. So great things happen when you file motions. Um, and you know, again, that's one of the biggest tools in our, in our toolbox. If you file a motion and the judge you know, um, denies the motion or you, know, you can't work something out with the prosecutor, or maybe you might not have a motion, well then it's trial or plea, right? If you take a plea, um, sometimes it's not a bad thing, especially if it's to reduce charges or lesser charges. But if there's a plea, then the case is over and whatever the sentence is, the sentence is. If you go to trial, well, then that's a whole long thing um, that we'll definitely be talking about in another video about what happens at a trial. But that's, you know, criminal defense lawyers love trial. Our clients don't always love trial, but, um, you know, it's something where we get to really go after the prosecutor and the, and the police and really present our case and you know, vigorously litigate on behalf of our clients. Trials are amazing and fun. You know, again, for us, not so much for the client because it can be a little scary and, and nerve wracking. Um, but that would be the ultimate thing. And then if you win the trial, you walk out the front door as a free person, right? We won, not guilty. Best, best two words you can ever hear in the criminal justice system. Uh, and if you lose the trial, well then you would get sentenced, right? Which could involve jail, could not involve jail, whatever then the judge would deem would be necessary. Um, and that's really kind of, you know, an, an overview, a broad-based overview of start to finish of what happens in a criminal shoplifting case. If you ever have any questions about it, you can always give us a call. Um, our phone number is 754-206-6200. Uh, we hope you like this video. Like it, comment, follow us, subscribe to us. Um, you know, we love giving free information out to people all throughout, you know, Florida and the country with all of our type of videos. And um, hopefully, hopefully we'll see you on the next one.